uh, you are all here, I assume, for this uh, <laughs> discussion. Uh, the title is A Long Time Coming, with a question mark, significantly, uh, Obama and the Politics of, of Identity. Um, my name is uh, Bill Sewell. I'm a, uh, uh, I teach in the political science and uh, history departments here at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, I am a, a fellow of the Center for Contemporary Theory, uh, fondly known as uh, 3CT. 3CT is the sponsor of uh, this event. Uh, and it's my privilege to introduce our distinguished speakers, Kathy Cohen and Adolph Reed. Um, this program is one of a series of events in, uh, in a lecture series that uh, 3CT is sponsoring on identity and politics. Um, I assume that some of you were at uh, a previous event we held back in, uh, in December um, that uh, was also focused on the presidential election and, uh, and the Obama phenomenon um, that featured uh, Lauren Berlant and Michael Dawson. Um, I want to uh, uh, also give, uh, uh, thank the, um, uh, the Frankie Center for providing us with space. Uh, obviously. And um, uh, for those of you who, uh, who uh, don't know about uh, 3CT, um, there's a sign-up sheet actually just outside the door uh, for anyone who wants to get more information about, uh, about us and our, uh, our doings. Uh, okay, without further ado, let me uh, introduce our, uh, our speakers. Adolph Reed is a professor of political science at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. He may be known to some of you as the author of some rather critical articles on uh, Barack Obama and the phenomenon of Obamism in the, that appeared in The Nation. Um, he is a prolific scholar, most of whose work has centered on one or another aspect of African American politics. He's the author of many books, including uh, Stirrings in the Jug, Black Politics in the Post-Segregation Era, 1999, W.E.B. Du Bois and American Political Thought, Fabianism and the Color Line, 1997, The Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, The Crisis of Purpose in Afro-American Politics, uh, 1986, and also in 1986, Race, Politics, and Culture, Critical Essays on Radicalism of the 1960s. Uh, according to his website, he's working on a couple of book projects at present, uh, one with the title, Making Sense of Race, What It Is, What It Isn't, Why It Matters, Why It Doesn't, and another to be called, When Compromises Come Home to Roost, The American Left's Retreat from Class Struggle and the Rise of Neoliberalism. Kathy Cohen is my colleague in the Political Science Department here at Chicago, uh, where she is the David and Mary Winton Green Professor. Uh, her work has focused above all on the politics of race, gender, and sexuality. She's the author of The Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS, and the Breakdown of Black Politics, published in 1999. 1999, is that right? Yeah, 1999. Yes. All right. A long time coming. Long time coming. Long yeah, time long time coming. coming. Uh, as well as many book articles and books chapters, she's currently working on um, uh, what is known as the Black Youth Project, uh, which uses diverse methodologies to investigate the attitudes, the culture, and experience, experiences of a wide range of African American young people. Uh, Kathy has also shouldered much more than her share of administrative burdens of this university, and we're grateful to her for that. Uh, she served brilliantly as the director of the Center for uh, the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and is now the deputy provost for graduate education, so graduate students present. Uh, she's the one who's uh, um, protecting your bacon. Uh, all of this while carrying on her career as a teacher and a research scholar. Um, this, uh, this program is, uh, is not going to be, you know, a lecture and another lecture and then, and then comments. Rather, it's going to be set up as a, as a discussion. Uh, so uh, Adolph and Kathy are going to launch into a discussion of the, uh, whatever it is they want to discuss. Um, and uh, whenever any of you uh, wants to break into the discussion, 
hold up your hand. And uh, um, I will. I, I think I'll leave it to you, oh. to the two of you, to, to call on people. Okay. Um, you know, when when you see fit. Okay. You don't have to call on them right away. Finish your point, okay. for sure. Um, okay. I'll only intervene if uh, if uh, you know things get too crazy. <laughs> so, okay. without further ado, go ahead. Okay. Well, we're not in Manhattan, so things probably won't get too crazy. But uh, um, um, thanks, Bill and Kathy thanks. and the center and everyone else um, you know, for putting this on. Uh, it's also nice to be back in Chicago uh, and in this neighborhood and in this state center district. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, well, it's kind of hard to say where to start. I mean, and 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 you gave you know really um, open-ended options. I was thinking, well, I could say I want to talk about Barry Bonds uh, or about uh, you know that that. Um, you know, the most pressing one, one of the five most pressing evils in the world, which is Duke University men's basketball team. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I guess the question is, what Obama's um, presidency, or the question that convenes us here, is what Obama's presidency means about, says about identity politics. R right? Is that um, um, a pithy way to put it? And uh, it's a question I've been grappling with. Uh, I've been trying to write about this, actually. Uh, some of you may, may uh, know I'm, uh, um, um, I'm in the midst of trying to fi finish a short book that is already overdue uh, on that question, partly on that question. Um, it's complex. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that answering the question, and this is you know, one of the reasons the book isn't done, uh, it requires first making more historical sense about of what identity politics, or what we call identity politics, right? Uh, you know, I mean, even that it is is a sort of problematic notion in a couple of different ways. One, it's um, identity politics is kind of like race from one perspective, right? We we all know what 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 we mean to refer to by it, right? But the fact of the matter is that when you start to think about the relation between politics and identity, it 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 becomes increasingly difficult to to distill certain strains of political activity um, you know, under the rubric uh, um, um, you know, identitarian and, and others under some, you know, some other rubric. I mean, in the U.S. typically, um, or rather in, in American academic life, because really nobody else talks about identity politics or, or anything like that, um, or in that language. Um, in the, in uh, the contemporary American academy, when um, you know the the um, um, you know the opposite of identity politics, um, typically uh, in in this conversation, to, um, especially to the extent that it's a debate, is something called class politics. And what that means is is just as complex and um, um, multifarious and um, um, contested, I suppose it, uh, it is a way to put it, as what um, um, is generally considered in this discourse community uh, as identity politics, right? Uh, and as a number, of, uh, as I mean, many critics on the, both sides of of this artificial debate have pointed, or this artificially construed debate have pointed out, class is as much um, a form of identity as um, as these others, right? Um, so. What to do, what to do, what to do. Well, of course, you know, there's no question that's so simple and, and clean and straightforward that an academic can't make much more complex. That's, that's kind of how we roll, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but increasingly, I've been thinking specifically, right, um, um, about the Obama phenomenon, which is actually a construction I've tried not to use just partly for a selfish reason. I don't want to be, be known as the phenomenon guy. Uh, but, um, um, you know, the different um, narratives that are uh, condensed around Obama, it seems to me, you know, more and more to make sense, uh, you know, to really get a handle on what's going on, um, I think requires um, trying to understand this partly in r relation to the emergence and, and uh, the evolution of a notion of race relations and, and the politics of r race relations, which uh, makes things a little more complicated still because, and I'm going to shut up in a minute. Uh, um, um, you know, because from there, there are at least two or three different ways to sort of track the genesis of of the idea of race relations, right? Or 
or two or or at least two or three different starting points, which which um, suggest different warrants about you know, how we should think about what this thing is. One is the emergence of um, liberal r racial ideology in, in the, the post -war, or post-war American post-war American racial li liberalism that that emerged in a specific historical context in a response to specific challenges and 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 and, and um, um, conflicts and political dynamics. A second is to sort of push the meter you know, of history back a little farther and, um, and um, try, try to situate the emergence of post-war ra racial liberalism partly uh, um, as an intellectual historical phenomenon, partly out of um, the, um, uh, uh, the academic regime of race relations scholarship that emerged in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, in you know large measure, um, you know around the corner from here, basically, uh, at, you know as did so much, um, and um, uh, and and in fact, well, well, I'll come back to that plug later. But um, but but now I have another plug. Um, yet yet a third and more interesting and still more interesting um, um, tack uh, calls for pushing the meter of, of, of history back a little farther uh, um, and uh, to take up the challenge posed by a very, very interesting book um, that came out a couple of years ago and uh, um, that apparently no one's paid attention to because people were apparently wait, waiting for the apology, you know, you know, for Booker T. Washington to come out, right? It is, you know, you know, that time in our history, it's always time for a new apology. Uh, but, uh, and, but an historian um, named uh, you know, Michael West uh, did a book in, uh, that was published in 06 called The Education of Booker T. Washington, in, in, uh, in which he lays out the very interesting argument that Washington was the founder of the notion of race, of race relations, not as a theory, but, 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 but he instantiated it through a kind of political practice and, and partly through, through his autobiography. In the sense that, um, and the story that you know, Michael West tells it, is that, okay, for, from say, from whenever you want to start it, right, until the Civil War, um, the way that you know, black Americans figured into national political life and to national political discourse was, of course, primarily as the Negro problem. And the form that the Negro problem took up to emancipation was, you know, what the hell are we going to do with them? Uh, um, we can't, you know, can't, can we keep them as slaves forever? And if we can't, then, you know, what happens? Can we absorb them? You know, everybody knows, you know, the Thomas Jefferson story who was convinced during the daylight hours that the braces could never co coexist. Things looked a little differently, you know, once the sun went down, apparently. But, uh, um, and then with, with emancipation after the Civil War, um, the nature of the question changes. And in fact, you don't talk quite so much about the Negro problem because black people uh, are um, in this 30-year period of um, contestation um, uh, geared toward establishing, well, not geared toward, but that was substantively um, driven by um, by efforts to establish what 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 an autonomous and an independent life, you know, with you know, within the American political economy and and the polity would would uh, you know would look like, so, you know, what forms it would take, how it would be enacted. So to that extent, from you know roughly the period, and um, I, I can feel feel real historians cringing at this, but um, at this kind of crude pip, at this sort of crude periodization, but from from the period roughly from the end of the Civil War um, to the final, you know, to, to the quashing of the final embers of uh, the Reconstruction experiment, um, it was rather more an open question uh, as to whether blacks could, in fact, wind up being part of, part of the American polity and you know, not a special problem to be administered. Um, you know, long story short, you know, um, the old story condensed, um, the uh, victory of white supremacy at the end of the 19th century um, take, takes, takes blacks out of civic life and um, then leaves the question, and sort of leaves the question of the Negro problem, right? But, I mean, here's the rub, um, that there is a sort of 
the racial li liberalism of the day could, could have handled, according to West's argument, uh, blacks not being e equal members of the society when they were slaves because their status was defined uh, as, as, as outside the polity. But, but after, um, uh, you know, but, but in the Jim Crow era, right, um, there was a problem, right? And uh, the problem as West characterizes it is that um, blacks were clearly not slaves and were protected by the Constitution, but there was an understanding that they, uh, you know, that the South had basically won or the planter South had basically won and, 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 and the challenge for no Northern liberals was how to um, accommodate themselves to this re reality. Well, then West's argument is, you know, um, up, up comes Washington, as it were, uh, to propose a way to sidestep this, this problem of the Negro problem um, through positing um, what used to be called the Negro problem as a problem of the relation between the races. And as he argues, blacks then cease to be, to appear at all as farmers, teachers, fathers, mothers, children, students, you know, stonemasons, they are Negroes. Uh, and the social, and, 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 and the question of unequal social re relations then becomes, you know, recast not, not as a question of equality or of inequality or of injustice or anything like that, but as a matter of the relation between the races. And uh, more specifically, to the extent that there's a problem, the problem is understood as bad race relations. Well, if the problem is bad race relations, then what's the alternative? I mean, then what's the solution? You know, the solution has to be good race relations. And you can have good race relations without having justice, without having equality. You can have good race relations simply by not having lynching or black people uh, being able to complain or, or you know, this, that, and the other. All right, so this then, West argues, is is the fundamental, um, is, the, is um, the essential logic of the notion of race, of, of the race relations that began to take, take shape in American political discourse uh, in the early 20th century. And, and, and in fact, um, I mean, I'm sure, um, you know, that for some people at least, you know, the notion um, race adjustment, um, you know, will come to mind. I mean, that's how, you know, I mean, that's, you know, the, the uh, strategic imperative of, of, of what I might now call race relations engineering at, at the, um, um, in uh, the period around the first, first World War was to adjust the relations between the races so that people like uh, the sociologist uh, sort of, I guess he was technically a mathematician, uh, Kelly Miller he actually did a book called Race Adjustment and people talked about it constantly. All right. So this then, this then, according to West, is the rational kernel of, uh, of, uh, of this ideology from which um, you know, eventually emerged you know, the philanthropic efforts to, to, uh, to you know, negotiate um, you know, the black migration and incorporation of blacks you know, into cities, uh, the links between Carnegie and you know, always right, the University of Chicago is just sort of throbbing here. Um, <laughs> And I mean, this was even before that one block of 57 became one way going east for reasons that nobody <laughs> could understand. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and um, you know, I'll just kind of, um, you know, well, I, I mean, I could take the story up, up, up to World War II. I think the post-war, um, I think the, I think the, Evolution of post-war ra racial li liberalism uh, um, is um, a better known and a more reflected on story, uh, and one that would be interesting for us to talk about. Um, you know, I think I'll I will just end at 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 this point by saying that that I think to answer the question that that that's the source of the original provocation, um, it requires certainly um, you making sense of of what Obama's election or his emergence and election, the whole schmear, um, says or, uh, or how it connects to how it emerges out of 
um, how we've all come, come to think about race and this thing called race, re race relations um, in the post-war period. see any hands, so I'll go for it. Okay. Yeah, All right. Absolutely. So um, uh, first I want to thank 3CT. I want to thank everybody here for coming. Hopefully we're going to have an engaged, contentious, exciting discussion. Uh, I said I was thrilled to be here because Adolf is probably at least one of the people who is more uh, negative about Obama than I am. So I had a little cover, so to speak. Uh, and I should start by saying I'm not, you're not going to like this, not necessarily negative. Mm. You're like, oh, she's backtracking already. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I got to live here. I got to live yeah, here. Um, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I do think uh, this is a, a moment for us to have some kind of critical reflection on the Obama presidency, our understanding of identity politics, the mobilization of identity politics, both the positive and the negative, uh, the question of long time coming and what is it that in fact has arrived. Um, because we might argue that in many ways it is an extension of a history or trajectory of black politics that has seen us move from uh, elected public officials in the late 60s, 1970s that were in clearly racially contentious districts and elections to what I've called kind of a second wave that um, became more technocratic black mayors who deracialized, if possible, at times um, uh, their, their elections to uh, hold public office that Adolph has talked about brilliantly in terms of kind of the systems of governing that these mayors ascribed to uh, that neglected communities and neglected uh, black communities in particular. Uh, to go with corporate interests uh, in the in the need for uh, resources as a tax base left. I mean, um, and then there's this what I have called kind of the third wave of, of, I guess we can call them black politicians. And in this kind of third wave, I would put President Obama, I would put uh, Deval Patrick, mm -hmm. and the aspiring, always aspiring Cory Booker as examples right. of. Uh, this new generation of um, what I would say are kind of race leaders, not race leaders. Because I think, in fact, for them, the category of being raced is being imposed on them. It's, in fact, they would like to, they see themselves as transcending that, that period. But uh, let's just say maybe a little bit about kind of, uh, let me say a few things about identity politics and we can kind of get this moving, which is, you know, there, there is a way in which there's an argument that, um, and I think we've all said it, uh, you know, we have to remember that uh, President Obama is a politician and a centrist, center-left, let's say. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt today and say uh, <laughs> a center-left politician. Um, but for, for good or bad, that is what he is. And I remind myself of that whenever I, I read something that he's done and I, I ask this question. You know that question, what would Jesus do? Well, some of you do. Um, I don't ask that question. I ask, what would Hillary have done? Oh, 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 oh. I thought you were going to say Hamlet. And if Hillary would have done the same part. thing, then it seems to me, in fact, we have a centrist Clinton-esque politics continuing um, that maybe was in abeyance for eight years, but now has kind of reemerged. Um, now, in those more cynical moments when I think, oh, he's a centrist politician, um, I also have to recognize the, the kind of symbolic importance of Obama. And I've had to deal with that in a way that I didn't want to. I wanted to just kind of analyze him in terms of his uh, appointments, what his cabinet looked like, who was contained in the cabinet. But every day I'm reminded of the kind of symbolic importance of Barack Obama to all sorts of people who have been kind of marginalized, made invisible, uh, neglected, and who have been silenced. Now, I might make the argument that in many ways their lives do not change with President Obama. But I am not going to deny them kind of 
the centrality that they believe, at least the symbolic representation of Barack Obama has in terms of some form of identity politics that either moves them to the polls or gives them a different attachment to the state, which I think could be, in fact, dangerous. Um, but, you know, when I went into, I think it was Subway, and the young black man was waiting on me, he was like, hey, hey, we got a black president. I was like, yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had, I, I remember uh, the day of the election, going out to get the paper at 6 a.m., and there were these two young black men with their hoodies walking down the street. Now, you know, I wasn't worried. I was behind my gate and everything. But, uh, <laughs> but they were, and I wouldn't have been worried anyway. But they, and they said, hey, we're going to vote. And it was like, wow, you know, I, I want this to happen. Um, but then there's the question of kind of the long-term impact of this type of identity mobilization. And... Uh, I worry about identity in the other aspects of what I would truly call identity politics. And really the history of what we've seen with identity politics, especially in the work that we do around kind of black communities. Mm -hmm. we, we've both seen kind of the demobilization of poor black communities when in fact black elected officials have neglected the needs of those communities and have decided in fact that their reelection uh, campaigns are, are probably um, advanced by demobilizing those those communities. We've seen, at least I felt like I saw in this last election, the presidential election, the unwillingness of colleagues, of individuals who have uh, the media's attention to engage in a kind of debate, deliberation about what Barack Obama means for black voters and black communities. And so in many ways I've worried about an identity politics that has shut down deliberation and discussion and really kind of the fundamentals of supposedly what is the democratic process. I, I worry about um, identity politics under a black president that allows a racialized state to continue to target uh, black and Latino and Asian American and folks of color and poor people and an expanding group of what we might call kind of the, the expanded underclass, mm -hmm. right, gays and lesbians. Uh, under the pretense that uh, these can't be racialized policies, in fact, if you have the head of state as a black man, right? right? And so you have a racialized state that has the cover of being non-racial um, because, in fact, some people believe that since Barack is there, that that means that, you know, racism no longer exists. I, I worry about a racialized politics that, um, an identity politics that we've talked about also before that kind of glosses over the significant differences um, that exist in, in communities of color and in black communities where suddenly, um, and you've said this, you've written about this also, and that that in many ways. Uh, as have you. As have you. No, no, but I was going to say this part also. Well, we've both have written about this. Uh -huh. That, you know, and, and if you begin to kind of look at President Obama's, and I would argue, attacks on poor black people and attacks on black youth, some of those attacks are to the right of Clinton. Yeah. Um, some of them are, you know, the don't feed your children, Popeyes, um, you know, you all need to, like, stop wearing sagging pants and you got a bad attitude and he references them as pookie and, um, so, huh? Cousin pookie. Well, he, in different cases, there's a cousin pookie, there's a pookie, and I'm just telling you, I know he doesn't know a pookie, but that's all right. Um, I know a pookie, but he doesn't know a pookie. Um, <laughs> So I, I do worry about also kind of an identity politics that allows a pretty vicious attack on poor people of color uh, under the auspices of this is tough love from inside the community, right? Um, I worry about an identity politics that uh, doesn't demand an explicit articulation of how the policies being promoted by this administration is going to impact, in particular, again, poor people of color and poor black people. I mean, my, my, my dear friend, Barbara Ransby, have talked about this. She's talked about kind of the fact that, you know, you, you, we won one election, and what about the two million people who are still incarcerated, right? Um, what about the fact that 50% of all HIV AIDS cases are from black communities? What about the fact that 20% uh, of the population in D.C. is HIV positive, right? Um, so how do we uh, deal with 
identity politics that both at some level can be uplifting, right? But that and also can be uh, uh, damaging, I think, to the type of mobilization that you've in particular talked about that needs to happen to hold not only uh, President Obama accountable, but any kind of electoral official accountable. So in that sense, it seems to me a long time coming, it's kind of the same mm -hmm. situation. Um, but I don't want to, again, negate the significance of the symbolic nature of what it is to have mm -hmm. uh, a black man, emphasis on black man, as the, the head of the state. Right. Yeah. Maybe uh, I'll stop. Yeah, can I say a couple yeah, things? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, um, I, mean, I knew, and I assume you knew too, um, um, and, and, and I hope that nobody in the audience was expecting anything different because you'd be disappointed because this, would, because this wouldn't be a mud wrestling event since, since we uh, are, are very close to each other in our views on this stuff. I guess a couple things. One of them is, I mean, just, to, you know, just one little point about um, um, granting people the moment of elation. Mm -hmm. okay. it, I certainly understand that. Right. And, you know, I mean, I was out uh, on, on election day just like everybody else was and could see it and, and mm -hmm. the days before and days after. You know, one little anecdote, okay. Um, you know, my father uh, was um, a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of, um, uh, one of FDR's prisoners for peace in, in the, or of peace in Belgium after World War II, you know, when they didn't want to demobilize you men and bring them home because it couldn't be absorbed into the labor market. He was in Belgium when uh, Roosevelt died. And he was in the theater um, watching the newsreel, you know, that used to show before films back in the day. Uh, and they would do a man in the street thing, or a person in the street thing, and um, asked a black woman in, in Harlem what she thought about, you know, FDR, you know, having died. And th this was the first she heard of it, and she was stunned, and she fell to her knees and was crying and said, um, Oh God, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we can understand why. But my father said his reaction when he was sitting there in the theater was, well, yeah, I know what you're going to do. You're going to get up and go downtown and clean out a white woman's kitchen today, just like you did yesterday and just like you did tomorrow, right? So, I mean, it's, you, and it, it's got to be necessary to hold both, both things in one's head at the same time. I mean, you know, for us anyway, because that's part, part of the curse of Doing what we do for a living, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. To hold both, the, but to hold, you know, to hold those, you know, to hold that co contradiction in one's head, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to appreciate, cherish, and even revel in, you know, the moment of elation that that people have. It's kind of like the church thing, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, I and mean, that's one observation. I think the other, um, it, uh, you know, has to do with with your last point. I think. Um, that, it, yeah, I think it's right, but this is exactly the thing I've been trying to grapple with, that um, there are ways in which this is something different and in which it's not something different at the same time. Um, you know, from one perspective, I mean, this is a fulfillment or the fulfillment of, um, of a particular notion of, of, of equality of opportunity that the NAACP had embraced for most of its history, right? Uh, and it, and even strains of black power, right? I mean, I remember Na Nathan Wright, or, or, or his brother, one of them, the Wrights, you know, the black Wright brothers, <laughs> uh, you know, laid out as, as, as an agenda for black power in the late 1960s, that black people should be 12% of everything, right? 12% mm -hmm. of the corporate uh, boards, 12% of the unemployed, 12% of everything in the middle. Now, that's one notion of racial equity, and it certainly makes sense as, as, as notions of ra racial equity go. I mean, I don't do the kind of political theorizing that my president at the University of Pennsylvania does, uh, so I'm not sure, but, uh, but, you know, that's one. And there is a sense, then, in which um, Obama's election is a fulfillment of one of the contested um, or you know, one of the objectives of right. of the contested um, struggle for you know, black Americans um, justice uh -huh. in the United States, mm -hmm. right? right? At the same time, you know, um, you know, obviously there are ways in which it isn't the fulfillment of much, actually, right? right. Um, you know, except a nice thing for him, right? Um, I thought of another. Uh, right, I thought of another. Um, 
um, you know, anecdote. I mean, um, you know, Chris Rock's bit about the O.J. Simpson trial, right? But he said, I went to my mailbox every day for two weeks looking for my O.J. prize, and it just never popped never up. Happened. And and most black people aren't getting that um, you know, Barack Obama prize either. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, you know, that's not his fault, right? No. Uh, and so this is the fulfillment of something, but then, you know, uh, what it is the fulfillment of is itself complex and contested. I was going to agree, and people should – oh, you got a hand up already. But uh, let me, I'll just finish this. It'll take all of one second, which is there, – there is this kind of question of demographic representation, but mm -hmm. then it gets even more um, difficult because, in fact, who does he represent, right? right? Um, th there is a way in which we have, um, I think, easily uh, erased – the kind of the his own kind of Im immigrant history by a nice uh, gesture or categorization mm -hmm. of African American. Now, part of it, I think, is the way in which in this country we generally can't handle right the complexity of race and the ways in which folks of color, in particular, um, can have kind of multiple relationships both to a racial and ancestry, ancestry that is here and elsewhere and things of that sort. Yeah. Now, he, he, I think, also has, um, I dare say, um, manipulated that also, right? So there's a, there is a way in which I feel like, and I think you would probably agree, that uh, there is a movement in terms of his racial promise, I would say, his racial status and his racial promise. Um, and so he can... Uh, be a uh, quote unquote authentic black man mm -hmm. who can preach about fatherhood, even though we could question kind of what is the, what are the indicators of good fatherhood? And if part of it is being present and you're an elected official and you're never present, we might wonder like, do you have the status to talk about fatherhood? And in fact, uh, we could also, pardon me, but you know, we could also question what it means not to have a father since he didn't have one and he's president. Right. Right. I mean, it didn't handicap him very much, so. E exactly. Right. Um, there's, there's the way in which there's an, a racial authenticity, I think, also that happens through Michelle right. Obama, right? That right. Uh, for everybody who's not quite sure, I've heard this on more than one occasion, we, we should really be comfortable and proud and happy that he, you know, he married a black woman. Right. Like that was like, you know, right. that was a real hard <laughs> thing for him to do. Well, at least he married a black woman. Um, but I do think there's this kind of, moment of kind of what's the racial promise here. There's almost a wink wink with I think black communities that we've seen before with black elected officials, which is, you know, just hold off, don't press me. Right. Once I get in, you know I'm gonna take care of you. Right? Um, and we've seen it also from many of his supporters who have said, stop complaining, right. don't don't raise these issues, just hold on right. when he gets there. We'll come back for you. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come back for you. But the other part of this is I think, you know, these first, where he's like the first black president, mm -hmm. I think he's also making a promise sometimes to white people that says, I'm the first, but this will be the last time you'll have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Right? So the promise is not just about first, but it's, it's an ending. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to end the discussion about kind of racial inequality or a kind of s systemic racism because, in fact, we've, you've allowed me to be president. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just think the kind of political, oh, Bob is disagreeing, but the political, I think, that's good, that's good. I think the political landscape just changes significantly, yeah. right? Especially when, whenever there's a kind of, uh, an office that's not kind of based on a racialized district, mm -hmm. right? So his, his kind of constituency of legitimacy, I've said this before, is not the black community, right? His constituency legitimacy were really those Iowa voters who said, you know what, I'm going to, uh, white Iowa voters who said, this guy is viable. Yeah, right? well, if you want to go back to basics, it's these people right here. Oh, well, yeah, his, uh, his Hyde <laughs> right. Park constituency? Yeah, right, and this uh, is where, uh, uh, this is where the baby came from. <laughs> right? well, so, I mean, let's, it, I'll just be real about it. 
I don't. I don't think it's well. I don't. I don't think this group. I, no, no, as much oh, as I no, love no, them, no, no. they don't have enough power to give anybody legitimacy, right? Because they. <laughs> no, but I mean, they've at the already opening of the career. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Right. This happened right. happened in Hyde Park. Right, and then moved degree. out from there. Right. right, but it wasn't because of no, no, this no. group. No, not, no, not no. this. No, group, I mean Hyde Park in general. Right. right. There were two people who had hands. Right. Um, well, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm wondering, what if we move our discussion even bigger than Hyde Park and think about it identity politics? And think about what this might represent as kind of a turning point. I mean, as, as we know, right, then this neoliberal order is global, and in some ways it means that sort of the Amer we have now the global north and the global south kind of come home. So if we think of like American poor of color as in some way part of this, the global south with this fast paced kind of freedom of capital to sort of move, you know, to have no national borders and how that impacts then Americans themselves and reconfigures their identity. And then now at the same juncture, right, we have a president with some kind of international resume. Clearly there's people around the globe who have, you know, in the same way the young man at Subway had a symbolic representation. I mean, that was happening globally Absolutely. in an interesting way. Um, you know, so we often talk about in the academy, going back to this reference of, you know, placing them in politics in the academy, I mean, another variation of that that's really been forceful in the last few years is talk, to talk about transnational political affiliation, transnational activism. And I wonder if there's any, if this is a moment to think about transnational identity politics, um, whether in a, on a grassroots way or even on a leadership way, like how we think about, you know, does he, does he, does, are, are there some openings? Well, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, I think you know, my hesitation is that you know, I think, at least from the standpoint of the U.S., um, most of the discussion of transnational politics is, uh, or, or, or transnational popular politics is kind of a hydroponic one, right? I mean, in the sense um, that you know, I think the biggest problem that we've got here is that there's no – uh, really organically rooted, um, you know, oppositional politics that's got any institutional base in this country at all, and um, it's and it may very well be, you know, you know my, you know, um, a failing in my imagination because uh, I don't have much of it anyway. But uh, but it's but but it's kind of hard for me to, as much as I would like to see, um, you know, how to make the move um, to. Um, construct the kind of transnational alliances that you mentioned, I just can't see in whose name uh, or what the popular forces there are here that, that would be capable of constructing it. I mean, you look at the labor movement, for instance, which is really the only uh, locus of any kind of institutionalized left of center politics in the United States that's, that's got any popular capacity. Um, apart from... Um, you know, there, are interesting, there were some interesting things going on uh, on that front with some small unions like the UE, uh, with uh, the Unite side of Unite Here, uh, but it, it looks like, you know, that union may be on the verge of dissolving again anyway. You know, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, I'm, at the same time, I'm really happy that you put the real N-word on the table, which is neoliberalism, right, because I think that, that at least on the domestic front. Um, um, you know, I think one of the, you know, one process that, that Obama's election may have accelerated or may be accelerate or may accelerate is what I've been trying to, what, what I've been calling it the want of a better way to characterize it is sort of, you know, sort of re-racialization, right? Um, by which I mean a kind of um, at least partial disconnection of, of racial discourse from phenotype. Uh, and that we can find ourselves, you know, I mean, go, going back to when Bill Weld was the uh, governor of, uh, you know, of Massachusetts, a friend of mine there said, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he did something, uh, he, he made some expression of tolerance about gays and blacks. And my friend said, yeah, he, he uh, loves gays and blacks and women as long as they're rich. Um, and, you know, but otherwise they can go to jail and go to hell, right? Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we see, like, with, with the, Call the dog by its right name, but right? it's sort of class consolidation of, 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 of this black, black.
black, um, largely Ivy, but elite university trained cohort of, you know, of, of um, aspirants to the, to, to the highest reaches of the professional managerial classes are, this, this, this is like another step of their incorporation in, of, you know, their incorporation into the ruling class, right? I'll just be as crude and old style Marxist as you expect me to be. Um, and, and especially to the extent that, that, that this move, do, you know, you know this, this incorporation does fulfill uh, one, you know, one goal of, of one strain of, of the civil rights movement, then it is what it is, right? And it's multi-sided, right? But it is what it is. And it does have the potential, I think, for uh, creating exactly the kind of ideological noise, right, you know, that you, you were talking about, Kathy. Um, while, and while further s cementing, you see, I think what, one of the things that's, that, uh, that's happened with us, and granted, I mean, this sort of take, takes us back, you know, from, from your question to, to the earlier, um, you know, brief about, uh, you know, the debates around what identity politics is, is that increasingly over the last 25 to 30 years, we've, we've found ourselves in American political discourse in which the, the only, in fact longer really, the only recognized language of injustice is a language of ascripted injustice, right? Um, ra racism, sexism, heterosexism, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and this fits very nicely you know, within the neoliberal framework, right? I mean, people can, we can celebrate diversity, right? Um, we, we, can, we can open opportunity structures, uh, but while sort of deracializing or, or you know, deracial, or, or, or rather re-racializing, you know, the underclass, right, on, on and at least partly or, or, or more loosely or partly non-phenotypic, or more loosely, or more loosely phenotypic basis, right? I can imagine, for instance, seeing a race of pedophiles, right? I mean, just from the way the discourse goes, right? Um, that um, you know, you know, the resurgence of 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 all kinds of ge genetic determinism, right? Uh, sort of uh, you know, reopens the you know the potential for creating of all sorts of uh, or for the emergence. Of you know all sorts of de facto ra racial groups that need to be monitored, controlled, which which of course would um, would disproportionately overlap the uh, exist or the currently stigmatized groups that are defined by ph phenotype, because that becomes you know the truth that makes it work on a um, folk level anyway. Uh, and um, and there's a sense sense in which you know I mean I'm struck I mean. Partly because, of, you know, to be completely honest about it, um, Obama and, and the crowd around him are those people that we all in, in this room know very well. The older ones of us, you know, like me, taught a bunch of them at Yale in the 80s, and they would, you know, go home from, from whatever they were doing to watch the Cosby Show to, you know, sort of model, you know, their appropriate black upper class behavior, uh, and, and, and completely understood that the purpose of the civil rights movement was for them to be able to go to work at uh, you know, Morgan Stanley and stuff, uh, and this has happened, right? Um, so I mean, this this is a stratum that is now being incorporated, and you know, I mean, like from, you know, I mean, as I said before, um, you know, there are multiple metrics of of, of justice, and um, and you know, none of them emerges from you know from nature, and you know, th this is one, and I grant that this is one, right? I mean, if you're going to have have a sharply class polarized ne ne neoliberal order, then it's less undemocratic uh, if 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 uh, people are permitted access to it wi without regard for invidious ascriptive status. That's a little bit like saying for you know to me you know saying like you know saying for pygmy is a real good rebounder, but you know but that's a metric of justice that you know could could uh, work. 
<laughs> so, I, and I mean, I apologize because because I know that I've taken your your uh, question of, <laughs> and gone someplace entirely different with it, <laughs> right? Uh, but I mean, I think I did you know, give you know, my response to it initially. Okay. I'll plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very quick. So, Martha, I, one, I think I don't know if I have a broader imagination than Adolf in terms of the ability uh, to see the possibility for transnational. Uh, international organizing. Maybe it's because, in fact, I watch uh, the younger, but it, the young people that I'm surrounded by do all sorts of organizing that don't look like traditional union organizing that, in fact, I think has a huge impact. It, it may not be connected in, in terms of the traditional sources of kind of chapters or affiliations. There may not be kind of a centralized bureaucratic structure, and you, you might argue, in fact, because of the loose structure, it doesn't have the same ability, in fact, to, to mobilize, to gain resources, to, to act as a really kind of transformative and demanding force with regards to the state or the economy. But I, I do think that there's something to be learned even from the Obama organizing that we saw both online and offline, right? Um, and that we've seen the kind of transnational organizing we've seen for quite some time, the ways in which um, ideas and methods and tactics, in fact, are um, kind of uh, dispersed or, or delivered to other parts of the world where there isn't a kind of face-to-face -face interaction. We, we know that from the study of social movements. We know, in fact, that there are also other ways in which people uh, organize around social movements, the whole idea of kind of new social movements, which look very different than kind of traditional social movements. So I think there's the potential, and I think there is the potential, again, with the symbolic nature of Obama being, the Obama administration being open. Now, on the other hand, I think there's the actual kind of policies that we've seen, the deployment of more troops in Afghanistan, the, the, the lack of clarity about when, in fact, troops will be leaving Iraq, right? The, the absence of any discussion around Gaza, that, that so we, again, can have an opening in terms of the appearance of a different type of internationalist uh, agenda that doesn't necessarily move very far from a very centralist agenda that we might have seen under the Clinton administration. And now we have, in fact, another Clinton uh, implementing <laughs> that agenda. So so I, I think that you've hit on something important, which is there's there's Obama and everything that maybe he represents and the, prob the problems and possibilities with that administration. And then there's the work of organizing. The, the real work of kind of transforming this moment. And, you know, he says it all the time, this isn't about me, it's about we, or it's about you. Uh, my concern is actually <coughs> more that he is capturing, and I've, I've argued this before, but and, and I've heard to the contrary, so I hope that's true, that he's capturing some of the mobilization that we might have expected to hold him accountable. That uh, some of the best organizers, some of the best innovators, <coughs> some of the best tech people, are actually moving into the Obama administration, not, not the administration, but his kind of, his, his yeah, apparatus. apparatus, exactly, the, what is it, Organizing yeah. for America, the, now I, I know that there are people in the audience who have seen, seen something different than that, and that's what I think we have to really focus in on, is how do we build um, institutions, or how do we support institutions that can understand themselves as both holding uh, Barack and the, uh, that administration accountable, at the same time as promoting his his agenda when in fact it does match the, the needs and the issues and the concerns of folks uh, in their different, whether it be identity groups, affiliations, or, or um, communities. So to me that's the possibility of globalization, but I don't necessarily believe it's going to be led by his administration and his policy. So I have a, uh, a couple of questions, um, one I guess for both of you, which is, uh, let's say a little bit more, and, and speak perhaps in a more nuanced way about how you're conceptualizing identity politics. I mean, it's identity politics, politi for, for politics to be identity politics, does it have to be predicated on, say, a, a, a centralist conception of identity, uh, uh, or uh, alternatively, you know, as Anthony Appley might say, is that identity politics predicated on a two-type scripted conception of identity, or 
Is identity politics and politics, any, any, any and all politics that, that, we, that, 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 that uh, some of my friends, Alcock might argue, uh, 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 uses uh, uh, race, I mean, racial identity politics or identity uh, uh, as, as a political consideration. It seems to me that those are very different ways of thinking about identity politics. And if you want to say that all identity politics, then it seems to me uh, still important to distinguish between the kind of identity politics that we're talking about, because it seems to me how we think about it. I know identity politics are different, mm -hmm. but they're really talking about one of these or the other. Um, a second question goes uh, more directly to Adolf. I was just wondering, I was very interested in what you were saying about um, uh, the history of race relations uh, 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 discourse. And I was wondering if you, if, if, if you would say a little bit more about uh, what you take to be the connection between race relations discourse and identity politics. Do you think that they're internally related? Do you think that identity politics, as you understand it, um, in some sense reflects uh, the history of race relations discourse? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. I mean, I do think it, it does in some ways, right? Uh, or or at least you know, what we think of as identity politics. And I'm going to defer to Kathy on a big question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and well, well, you can say what you think identity, because we may not be thinking the same thing. Well, no. Well, so I was going to say, and, and I promise you that whatever she says, I will agree with. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, right, I mean, as a way of defining identity politics. I mean, look, look, to be honest, I mean, I would just assume not have, have the discussion of identity politics. So I guess you ask, all right, well, then why would you come out here? But, uh, um, and, and I have reasons, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, there's just a way in which that debate, I think, uh, is, t has already become too much a pro forma debate, right? Uh, and there's a kind of you say potato, I say potato quality to it. Um, the forces on one side, um, you know, throw their opponents in the, bad with Haki and the forces on the other side throw their opponents in the bed with Todd Gitlin, right? And, um, you know, and, and I don't like either of those sleeper arrangements. But, um, um, but so, uh, so I'm like I said, I mean, you, you know, I mean, I haven't even, I've tried a little bit to think that through, um, but um, um, I'm not, but anyway. On, on the other question, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, at, at the most general level, w which is, you know, therefore most likely to be banal, right? Um, I think that what we, that the forms of political, ex or the modalities of political expression, which I think frankly, or, or, or rather that we identify, or that we think of as, as, as identity politics, you know, you know, I think are grounded ultimately uh, in, in, in the institutional and discursive uh, and, and uh, material uh, you know, mechanisms that came out of the war on poverty, the Great Society, and the um, emergence of Black Studies uh, as 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 an institution with budgets and lines and interests, and then um, you know, women's studies, um, et cetera, in uh, there to four predominantly white colleges and universities over the last thirty years. Um, that's, and also with the, with the emergence, and frankly, you know, the victory, right, of, um, of, of um, a, a particular um, political regime, right, uh, in black American politics, but I think we've seen it also in, uh, in uh, some Latino American politics, uh, both, on, both on the West Coast and Texas, among Chicanos and, and elsewhere, and of course Chicago too, what am I talking about? Um, that um, that are tied to um, the mechanisms of, um, of of American electoral pluralism, right? Uh, and uh, and and the expansion of or the continuance and expansion of of the post-war uh, national regime of you know, redistribution, partial redistribution of of the proceeds of publicly created economic growth, right, at the local level as, as well as the national level. And, and, and the sort of, you know, bad news, you know, within the good news of the victory of the civil rights movement, right, so that when, you know, Operation Push and, and uh, the Urban League become line items in, in the Carter administration budgets, right, and these are the sources, you know, the ostensible sources of, uh, of you know, political opposition uh, on uh, behalf of, of, of you know, black Americans, while there are tensions and 
contradictions that are already built in. As Kathy mentioned um, you know, you know, a good while ago, um, um, black incumbents have, have an interest, like all incumbents, right? I mean, I think incumbents are like a race, right? I mean, they have an, <laughs> right? I mean, all incumbents have an interest in keeping the number of people who can ratify or re reject their claims uh, to, to keep their incumbency as small as they possibly can, right? To keep it as close as they can to friends and family and people on their payrolls, right? So there's an interest. So in that sense, it's almost inevitable. Uh, well, I shirk from teleology, but 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 there are certainly strong tendencies, right, um, of, of a variant sorts as as well as others, that um, that um, Linked, um, you know, the the uh, victory of the um, of 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 the political regime that consolidated itself in Black American politics, you know, within a decade after the Voting Rights Act, and widespread Black political demobilization. This takes us back to my earliest you know, observations about the race relations paradigm. And uh, I mean, by the way, um, um, it's kind of interesting. It'd be nice if uh, uh, you know, Ken Warren had also been on this panel since he's done this kind of work. Probably, um, um, you're going back to the tur turn of, of uh, the 20th century as much as anybody else. Uh, but not more. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, to make you blush, man. But um, um, and 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 hope I don't have to sleep in the street because of that. But but um, um, but but it, um, you know, to go back to the point about the origins of this race relations re regime at, at, at the turn of the 20th century, one continuity with the, um, with, the, with the new black political regime anchored on office holders is the promise, right, uh, both, both from elected officials and from institutionally incorporated um, race advocacy groups, right, um, that uh, you know, the two-sided promise, right? The promise on the one side to re represent the interest of black Americans, uh, to define and re represent the interest of, of black Americans. Um, and on the other side, to, to keep black Americans or to, to, to contain the cost of maintaining, of maintaining social peace. And th this has happened in in, in black politics, in the women's movement, in the labor movement, in the public interest movement, in the environmental movement, right? And that's one of the reasons that I say that 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 at the institutional level, you know, you know all these movements are the equivalent of hydroponic plants, right? To, you know, they're all at the top. There's no roots, right? Um, that may not be good botany, but um, but um, so. Have I run out the clock yet? I'm trying to remember. No, that's very helpful. Yeah. No, okay. that's very helpful. You're saying, I mean, have mm -hmm. you you're saying that there's a kind of um, uh, notion of, uh, of the race as a kind of corporate body with an interest. Um, and and, that, and that, that the groups, as far as on one hand, to be authentic, uh, to the extent that it, uh, it, uh, 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 black elites, mm -hmm. black elected officials, to the extent that they're uh, acting on behalf of uh, a group corporate interest, uh, and that, that, that that's kind of like identity politics. Kind of at the same time, there's, a, there's, there's an orientation uh, towards, uh, you know, these various products. So, uh, right. and so uh, this, this is where the race relations come from. Right. right. So, no. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so I think, I think I that's okay. That's very helpful. All right. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll be very quick in terms of kind of this question of identity politics. I think, and, and we're not trying to blame anyone or call anybody out, but I think we both kind of resisted the idea that this would be a panel on identity politics because I, I can say at least for myself that there's no kind of clear marker of what we mean by right identity politics. There is the idea that in fact, about how, all the different modes of identity politics that were worried. Okay. Can, yeah, I said that. I, can, so, look, so. You're going to let me finish, Bob? Or well, what? Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, do you want to let me finish? Yeah, I'll do. So, there is a marker, if we can say, in the 1960s and 1970s, where we see the emergence of a discourse around identity politics, right? And we can also see that there's a kind of substantial literature that talks about the ways in which uh, there's a politics surrounding 
uh, groups of individuals who understand themselves to have a shared oppressed uh, uh, experience responding to that um, experience and kind of articulating their concerns in a framework that also uh, makes kind of primary their that identity category. It could be blacks, it could be women, uh, today it could be gays and lesbians. Now, what I think we would both kind of bristle at, so we can say that objectively we can see that this phenomenon called identity politics and this is how in fact it has manifested itself in the political arena. I think we both would say we don't believe, in fact, that there's a shared perspective. There might even be, to some degree, a, a somewhat common experience, but the idea that there's an articulated shared perspective from that group goes back to the role of elites here and the ability to kind of dictate kind of the narrative of the experiences of that group and therefore kind of diminish the significant differences that exist within that group. And that thing becomes something that's called identity politics, right? So that's in fact, you can agree with that. Yeah, I totally so, so the, so, it, but I mean the other piece of this, right, is that for lots of different scholars, there's a question about kind of the periodization of identity politics. None of us really believe, in fact, that identity politics suddenly appears in the 1960s and 1970s. We know, in fact, that the labor movement could be called identity politics. We could say that early evangelical movements were called identity politics, right? So. When we're talking about identity politics, we're talking about the phenomena that has been designated as that in the academy and trying to explain kind of if we take identity politics, or what I was trying to explain is if you take something called identity politics, what are the negative implications of an identity politics as I understand it as located in the academy? Is that going to answer your question? Yeah, somewhat. Okay. You know what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
that piece of it. And I'd just be curious to know what, what you think. Well, Mr. Kuzar, I'm going to ask you I mean, and I'm not saying the guy's perfect no, or that he has no, a perfect character. No, 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 no. I mean, I have a kind of different point than you, right? Um, and I, mean, I want to preface this by saying that Paul Wellstone was a dear friend of mine from, from college until he, he died, okay? Uh, and I had a lot of respect for Paul. But I say this to, to students all the time, right? That character questions just don't have anything at all to do with anybody who has any significant aspiration to political office in the system. I and mean, anybody who wants, who aspires to any office higher than a school board in, in a rural area, and probably not even that, <laughs> right? I mean, even a water commission, right? Is not gonna be somebody you want to have for your brother-in-law or for your sister-in-law, right? It, this will not be the kind of person you wanna sit across the Thanksgiving turkey from. It, 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 it's just not the way this thing works, right? I mean, they aren't real people in some sense. They're like holograms, right, <laughs> that, that are created by the forces that they think they have to respond to. Right? Uh, and you know, that's what I think ha has, has been one of the crucial mistakes, right? Uh, you, you know, one of my, frankly, one, one of my greatest personal frustrations <coughs> about what's happened to left politics in this country for the last 16, 18, 20 years. I mean, this notion, I don't know. Um, I mean, I once said to a friend of mine that it seems like I forgot to set my clock back one night and I woke up the next day and, 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 and all of a sudden the whole left had decided that we were going to elect somebody you know, to do stuff for us. Uh, you, know, you know, I mean, we got more out of Richard Nixon, right, for the things that most of us in this room are concerned about than we got from Bill Clinton. And it's not because Nixon was a better person, obviously. It's not because Nixon cared more about us. I mean, frankly, um, you know, I'm sure when Clinton had his crises of conscience at three o'clock in the morning and, and tried to imagine you know, the image of America that he wanted to see, it was a lot closer to what most of us in this room would, would want than Nixon's vision, because mo most of us wouldn't even be here in Nixon's vision. <laughs> so so, so I'd be very careful about that, right? Uh, and, and as far as the intelligence stuff goes, you know, I mean, I think what, one of the problems that maybe can be a benefit of being old, is that I can remember the Kennedy administration. And pardon the crudeness, but all those smart motherfuckers there uh, who conducted a genocide in S Southeast Asia. Um, you know, we've got Summers and these guys with the economy now. Um, you know, smart, right. you know, smart doesn't cut a lot of ice with me, actually. Uh, and, and in fact, it can be scary, right? Because the one thing that we know is that these pricey educations, right, uh, and God, especially the law school ones, are, are, are all about um, um, cultivating the kind of intellectual nimbleness, right, that helps you to harmonize the principles that you want to think you hold with what gets you paid, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, so, I, you know, I'm sorry, but I just... <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I, I would, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I, I would also kind of be careful of this idea of his character. And, and it's because I feel like, one, the bar is very low. I think, you know, a, a lot of what we're understanding now and the euphoria is about kind of there's no George Bush in office anymore, not just that there's Barack Obama in office. Um, two, uh, you know, the, the idea of his values, I. His values, to me, play a role in how, in fact, he governs. And those are my concerns. And his values, so far, are mixed for me. His idea that, in fact, um, and I'm not a big supporter of gay marriage, but in fact that there's a way in which certain subjects are not allowed to have the same rights as others is problematic to me. And then to kind of to ground that in um, a Christian belief, to me, is actually very dangerous. Because in fact, what's to say that the next president who decides that I don't deserve to, the option of an abortion and, and grounds their uh, explanation in a Christian belief, you know, why do I say that Barack is okay and that person, or George Bush isn't on that question? Um, his, I, I'll say it again, his attack on the poor, and I think in fact it has been at times an attack on the poor. It worries me. Um, now, you know, we can all talk, and we've talked about this, we can all talk about personal responsibility, 
But it seems to me part of the Christian ethic is you take your first, yourself first. And part of what he has to do before he attacks other people for being personal responsible is to also talk about the privilege that he has, to the ability to have kind of nannies and uh, disposable income and private education. That gives you a certain type of ability to parent that's very different, in fact, when you're working two jobs and you're trying to figure out daycare and, you, you know, you may have just lost your job. So I, I, I think, you know, there's a stretch there that I would like to see in terms of his values and character. Um, I think there was one other thing I can't remember about his values and character, um, which, which is the other thing, which is not only intelligent, but one of the things I hear people saying all the time, which is he loves his wife. And uh, I, I think he... Maybe he does, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm just not sure, again, it's relevant to my assessment of him as a president, unless what we're suggesting is we want a model of, of um, hetero, heterosexism that can, in fact, be modeled. Um, and if that's the case, then I, then I want to push back against that also. Um, so, you know, he loves his wife, okay. He didn't have sex with an intern. To me, the question is kind of a power differential there, not the sex. Um, and so I think, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which this idea that he has good values and good characters is really kind of also a, a normative and conservative positioning of, of what we're comfortable with as a country. Mm -hmm. The way I understand what's frequently called identity <laughs> politics is a form of identity like nationalism that denies political economic difference. And that's why I see class as different, even though people, of course, identify as members of the class. Uh, and it's to establish a kind of a corporate entity that is undifferentiated, but is, defi is defined in terms of and that's an entire discourse that's been bracketed very strongly on the left for 30 years. Now, it could be that there were very good historical reasons why issues of identity were put on the table because it had been bracketed before. But it seems to me that precisely the election of a black president allows for a consideration of the situation of African Americans also along class lines, not only in race terms. And I think, that, I think that that also is going to be extremely important. By class, what I mean is political economic differentiation. I'm not trying to, you know, sort of out of the old closet pull up a red flag of uh, old class politics. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's going to be extremely important also in considering the global situation, because terms like, as far as I'm concerned, um, third world or even global south really ignore massive political economic changes that have occurred in the last 20 years that involve differentiation not just among countries but within countries. And I think uh, that the problem with the politics that only focuses on these, on also the situation situations in the third, in what used to be called the third world, in these terms, is that you can end up with a very undifferentiated politics being supportive of groups and formations that one really shouldn't be supportive of. That it makes it much more difficult to be uh, differentiated in terms of solidarity and non-solidarity rather than these blanket forms. So I think that in a funny way, that precisely this election, uh, together with the demise of neoliberalism, <laughs> uh, could allow for a reorientation of left-wing politics that could take into account extremely important dimensions that have been bracketed. I think that's an interesting observation. I think it's possible. You know, I'm a political scientist, and we work best at predicting what's already happened. So, uh, so I can't say about that. But 
Yeah, I mean, it could. Uh, but, I mean, you're absolutely right, though, that a key ingredient, though, or, um, uh, you know, is the demise of neoliberalism. <clears throat> and I think they're working overtime to patch this thing up and to keep it going. And, uh, by the way, when we talk about Obama and his values, um, you know, I don't know how many of you saw, but he, he, he explained that, you know, we can't nationalize the banks the way the Swedes did. I mean, even though that worked and the Japanese model of kind of putzing around, uh, you know, it's kept the crisis going for a decade because culturally, right, um, you know, that's not how we do it here, right? So, um, you know, yeah, it's possible. I mean, yeah, my concern there too, and yeah, I mean, you know, I know I can, uh, well, I mean, I've already um, acknowledged I don't have any you know, real imagination, but, you know, when, when I look for where the, the leverage is going to come from, the first place that I look is those sources that have some institutional capacity. And what I've seen in like in every one of these movements, I think Kathy's absolutely correct about this, they're, they're inside the circle. Now, and they're part of, you know, to, to put it somewhat hyperbolically, they're part of Obama's police force that's, or the, or the ideological police force that's, that's pointed to the left. And yeah, for now, and, and, uh, and the nation is leading the way, by the way. <laughs> uh, hoping, right? Because you know the 2 a.m. booty call just has to work harder. But, uh, but I mean, you could be right, right? I mean, like it could, yeah. I mean, I can imagine uh, uh, possibilities, uh, you, you know, ways that this thing could play out over the next few few years that that could open space. You know, you know, I just don't see the space now, uh, but it's possible. C can I yeah. um, can I ask why you think, in fact, because you started with having a black president? opens up the possibility for this discourse because in fact it seems to me that in many ways it uh, works to prohibit the type of discourse that you're talking about and and I would go back to kind of the the symbolic nature of what Obama means for people who have maybe put aside a political agenda that would be at odds with kind of the patchwork of neoliberalism that he's engaged in right now and instead is still focused on the idea that it's almost being kind of a race traitor to uh, speak out against, mm -hmm. you know, Barack Obama right now. Uh, and that that has been part of the process throughout this campaign, throughout his rise. And, okay, you know what, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm just not sure how that discourse actually mm -hmm. is opened up and who, in fact, um, provides for that type of critical analysis and, and discussion because I think, now I, I know that there are certain organizations that I think haven't been bought off and will have to do that work within black communities. And you know, I have a, for example, a sister who works in a factory who was an Obama supporter, but she's mm -hmm. kind of like, wait a minute, I'm getting a little worried here about my job. So I think mm -hmm. some of the reality of, of the economic, political, and social situation is going to kind of make even clearer the distinctions, in particular class distinctions in, in many communities. But the kind of idea that a black president somehow facilitates that, I don't, I don't understand. And I think, you know, what's interesting, I just want to throw something back at, you know, we have not talked about kind of white people's role in, in, in Barack. And there, you know, uh, I just, I think it's interesting in terms of the identity politics. And I think the, the identity politics driving a lot of Barack is all about white people's identity. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Sure. And, and their hope that this no, is going to be I mean, this sister back here had her hand up for a good while. Yeah. No, I mean, this sister back here had her hand up for a good while. Yeah. I was going to ask a question because Eric Holder said recently mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. You know, talking about race, and you know, I wait, I watch way too much television considering I'm in graduate school and I was watching MSNBC. <laughs> and um, there's a discussion What's between. Well, math that you get more out of that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a discussion between Pat Buchanan and um, Michael Eric Dyson, and um, I saw <laughs> they're going back and forth. And just to go, I mean, just to you know, kind of speak to what Kathy is, you know, pointing to about um, white people. Um, Pat Buchanan was saying something about, you know, if Eric Holder wants us to have this conversation, 
you don't just throw around insults. You know, if I feel uncomfortable, I don't have to sit at the table. I will just walk away. And um, which I and I think like that kind that this question of comfort meshes really nicely into this um, this issue of race relations that you brought up earlier as well because um, there's a way in which <laughs> the way that the Obama campaign was was kind of structured was in a way to make people feel comfortable about talking about this. Um, and, and, you know, and also, like, thinking about race relations as familial, you know, kind of like relations, like family relations. So, you know, Pat Buchanan said at one, at one point during the conversation, well, you know, Michael Eric Dyson, you have to take responsibility for your black community. And Eric Dyson, you know, um, says back, you know, brother, you take responsibility as well. You know, in, in a way, but um, so, I mean, I'm, this is kind of all over the place, and, and I just want to pose this to you guys: like, what do you think in terms of this issue of comfort? Um, in terms of you know talking about race, it's almost as if it's demanded that in order, like, if you are you know bringing up race, that it's you know, incumbent upon you to make those that you're bringing to the table feel comfortable. Um, or, you know, yeah, I, I'll just... You know, I mean, I think one of the problems is, is that, that the categories are just too broad and too evanescent, right? Like, like for instance, you know, like the statement that race matters, right? <laughs> um, Cornell West and David Duke would agree that race matters, but, but they mean, you know, <laughs> I assume, quite different things, right, uh, you know, on that agreement. You know, the same with, um, you know, with the debates about um, you know, the causal character of racism. Well, in fact, racism is an abstraction and is an idea, right, that doesn't cause a thing, right? There are social relations patterned Right, that that have to do with inequality uh, or you know, asymmetrical power, that in, that in different ways at different times um, are 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 inflected through a narrative of race, and there are a lot of different kinds of those, right? Um, and the extent to which which we call all of them by, by the same language, you know, I think gets in the way of the understanding what the actual processes are, right? Which is not to say that that they that 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 they don't have any that that all of them, some of them, or or you know, any of them don't have something to do with with racial inequality. Okay. With respect to Holder's statement, once I heard what it was, I thought, well, so what the hell does it even mean? You know, uh, but 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 it's like one one of those cheese puff statements, right? Like you know, um, I believe the children of the future. <laughs> Right? I mean, uh, so, and frankly, you know, for most of American history, I don't think white people have been cowardly at all in talking about race, right? I mean, they weren't doing that, you know, it's time to go figure out whose turn it was to bring the cotton crop in. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> but, but I, but I very much take to heart your, your observation that this connects with the earlier discussion that we're having about the notion of race relations, because that's precisely, you know, um, you know the kind of discourse that emerges out of this framework of of you know, race relations that sort of hopelessly clouds, you know, as you say, the language of personal transactions, right? I mean, this this is how a moron like Shelby Steele, right, can get his 15 minutes over and over and over again, right? Um, the, you know, because um, whether the white uh, sales clerk in Atlanta airport puts the money in his hand and looks him in the eye is, you know, or, or the fact that she does that is a sign that there's no more, um, ra the, you know, there's no more ra racial inequality in the American South, right? It's just, you know, uh, and, and, and it's only because of this clouded, you know, you know, this clouded kind of discourse that that thing can happen. But this also speaks precisely to the point that you make about Obama and comfort. Um, you know, this is another anecdote. Uh, um, but an organization that I work with um, you know, has its office in D.C. And um, the building is owned by two women, um, you know, roughly my contemporaries, maybe a little older, 
feminist lawyers. They've argued cases before the Supreme Court. They're both white. And um, a couple of years ago, this was like, no, more than a couple of years ago, this was around the, you know, the Senate race. Um, you know, they were hyped, hyped about Obama. And, and one day when I wasn't there, they were talking about him. And one, one of them says to my colleagues, uh, you know, you know, what, you know, one of the things about him that I really like is that, you know, unlike a lot of black Americans, you know, he doesn't have that chip on his shoulder that a lot of them have. Right? And, in, and um, I just, I mean, I, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't read the first version of Up From Slavery. I, I mean, I read the second one, you know, The Audacity of Banality or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> but, but I just saw, <laughs> you know, I just saw not too long ago uh, that um, um, a quoted passage from the first book uh, where he says that uh, he remarks that he um, was intrigued to learn when he was in high school, I guess, in Hawaii, how, how well white people uh, you know, respond to a black person who's articulate and doesn't seem frightening, threatening. See, now, you know, I've got to say this about the character thing, too. Yeah, it's an interesting observation about this guy in, in a particular, because... All, you know, all that I've seen you know, about him in the public record is his protean character, right? That he's been, right? I mean, it's like the music man in a way. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's been a constant process of, of invention. Felix Krull, confidence man, right? Uh, you know, uh, constructing, you know, the, the persona with an eye you know, always to the next level up, right? So you call that character, okay. But, yes, I mean, so there is, and, and I guess that speaks back to your question of Moish's formulation, that, you know, I mean, there is a way that, that white people, you know, that a lot of white people get to feel happy about themselves. Oh, and, and uh, but look, <laughs> but, but in all fairness, you know, in, in, in ways that aren't uniformly bad or, dis, or dis, disingenuous, right? I mean, it does, you know, because it does say something about, um, a victory of a certain kind, uh, you know, based on what, what the NAACP has been trying to do and, and, and what I suspect most people in this room had been raised, you know, all of their lives to, to think of as the goal of, of ra racial justice in America or, or as a significant goal of racial justice right. in America. Now, I mean, just because we have been raised to think about that, I mean, it doesn't mean that it wasn't. Right, but it, it, it is interesting that people could be, uh, you're right, that people can be and I want to get back to the comfort. Um, white people mm -hmm. can feel good, genuinely, about this. Right. Uh, even white people in Hyde Park, when in fact they're surrounded by mm -hmm. black communities that are not benefiting at all, right, right from an Obama effect, an Obama presidency, right. at least initially. Or that. And, uh, that, that me, but <laughs> and who they depend on the police to protect well, them from. Well, absolutely. <laughs> right. Or, you know, or complain right. about when they have to take their kids to the emergency right. room yeah. because, in fact, there are all these poor black people who right. don't have insurance who are there in front of them. So it seems to me a kind of a contradiction to kind of. You know, I, I had a colleague, this is my favorite story. Uh, <laughs> Walk up. There are so many, though. And, and, and he grabbed my hand and he said, congratulations. And I was like, I literally thought I had won something. Yeah. I really thought I had won something. Like, MacArthur, right. And I was like, oh, Bill, don't read my books. Um, so, uh, so I wasn't sure what I was being congratulated yeah. for, right? right? So, I mean, so it, I mean, that's an extreme. We keep telling right. these stories. Right. But w one of the things that I will go back to, to Ansley's point about is this idea of comfort, but it's also kind of, I think, a restructuring of the, of the discussion about race and racism, right? So, and I think Barack participates in this, which is this idea, in fact, that this discussion has to be equitable, it has to be fair. We have to talk about racism, but we also have to talk about kind of black people and the threat that they pose to white people, their sometimes unwillingness to do what is right. And, and so I think in terms of this kind of transformation in race relations, um, Barack is playing a role in that. So at the end of that conversation when, you know, uh, Buchanan says you, you have to take responsibility and Eric says you have to take responsibility, it's like there's this equal dynamic here in terms of understanding power in the historical tradition of kind of the ways in which racist violence and racism has existed in part through the hands of the state in this country. And that's also, I think, something 
to be concerned about. I remember there, there were two people who uh, made an impression at, when they were talking about kind of the importance of the Obama nomination. One was, I think, and I, I have to find the, the tape, I think when Kennedy uh, was at the convention, he said that I'm supporting Barack Obama so we can have an end to discussions of sexuality and race and gender, like, okay, that, you know, <laughs> that's it. And then the night of the election, I remember Bill Bennett on CNN saying, okay, folks, that's it. You got your black president? I don't want to hear another thing from you people about, like, racism or inequality or discrimination. And it seemed to me very interesting that you have both Bennett and Kennedy professing at some level that the election of Barack Obama, that does it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's move on. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. No, I didn't mean. We're, we've already gone past our, uh, oh. our allotted time. Oh. Oh. Um, and I, what's that? Maybe one or two more if you guys you want to take another okay, sure. uh, question. One, sure. one more question. You can okay. choose. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I was kind of back because I just had him for Barbara a long time. Did Barbara have her hand up? Because she had her hand up. Thank she, you. she went home. Oh. Barbara's like, okay. forget you all. That emerged with um, the institutionalization of black politics in in what remained of, of the post-war post growth regime <coughs> happened to other movements. So that we accepted, for instance, what I've been calling um, um, in an analogy to what N Nelson Lichtenstein refers to as a collective bargaining regime, the permit regime, right? We have marches, right, that, um, you, know, you know, we've traded building the body count at demonstrations for the possibility of disrupting normal activity, right? So we have marches that go get a permit and, and, and satisfy the authorities um, because, you know, that makes it more possible for us to build a body count at the march. Uh, and then so we, and, you know, they've gotten a lot smarter about this stuff too, so they herd us down down streets where nobody will be, where we don't disrupt traffic, and we go into a park where no, nobody is present but us. So we have to uh, evolve uh, you know, self-entertainment culture, right, like the turtles and stuff, right? Uh, and I mean, I don't really go to those things anymore, but, but, but in, but in. You're just keeping it for well, yeah, you know, in their honor, you know, like on the morning of the march, I will in the shower maybe give some of the speeches, right, because I know them all, right? <laughs> As I look out at this sea of faces today, young, old, black, white, men, women, gay, straight, we're going to send a message to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and then we all go home, right? Um, and now that's one strain. The other strain is the smart... Um, smarter than the old school 60s activist types, right? Who you know, understand, right, of, you know, um, um, by virtue of, of um, adoption of the sort of neo olinsky SEIU style of, of, you know, style of organizing and trade unionism, right, a sort of latter-day syndicalism, um, that um, commitment to a larger objective than something that can conceivably be won in the next two weeks or so, uh, or in the next cycle of, of Congress, is naive and armchair activism, right? This kind of feeds nicely, right, into a career trajectory that enables people to move from union staffs to public interest group staffs to congressional staffs, and there's a culture around this, right? right? I mean, there's a new movement be or, or activist based, uh, but, uh, well, a new activist based petite bourgeoisie. Um, two words might, might, might help to condense an image. Samantha Power. Um, so, so, so there's that, right? And, uh, so, I mean, in this context, <clears throat> then, so, I mean, this is the context of what's happened to the new left, right? Uh, and so, how that has to, well, you know, I'm kind of puzzling over you know, the question of, of the impact on how the new left ontologizes race, uh, since race is an ontological notion in the first place, right? Um, um, I mean, that might be something more interesting to, uh, to discuss over a glass of wine, but did I, but the, did I address 
in some way all three of the questions or can, can I okay mm -hmm. I, I just want to say two, two things about the question one is I think um, I think Adolf was right when he started with what new left almost mm -hmm. anymore I think to continue to kind of fetishize the new left as opposed to understanding the different forms of mobilization that we see um, both on the ground and online is a real mistake and I think what the Obama uh, presidency may do <coughs> is to have the academy actually catch up with what in fact is happening outside of the academy with regards to organizing. That it is no longer just a game of the old left or the new left, but in fact, and we may not like it in terms of kind of the ideological uh, fluidity almost of these movements and activists, but I think those categories, uh, while helpful to us in terms of kind of the literature that we refer to, doesn't really map on to kind of what we're seeing in terms of the type of mobilization. Now that may mean that the mobilization in terms of kind of truly transformative ability doesn't exist anymore. But I would, I would take issue with some of Adolf's characterizations of what's happening in terms of the mobilization from groups like Insight or Critical Resistance. Or, and these are groups, not, right. not movements. But in fact, often we call something a movement like 40 years later when we're able to see kind of the connections between groups. That we or when they build something. Right, we generally don't start with saying, but here's, that here's the movement. Can but have some anyway, capacity yeah. and can assert their will politically. Adam, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. You, no, no, yeah. no, 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 I just yeah, felt bad I, for I think we really have to. Uh, yes. And this, this could have gone on for a very long time. I wish we could. Thank you very yeah. much, my sister. Mm -hmm. I think what we should do <laughs>